for coming. This is a salon of January 30th, uh, 2016. I still got my marbles. They ask you know, all the time, you know, what's the date, what's the year? I, be, I asked a lot of people that when I was a psychiatric resident, what's the, you know, who's the president of the United States, go back five of them, and uh, like that. And when they couldn't get them, I knew they were sane. <laughs> you know how that works. So I'm going to talk about body and soul. And uh, we're not going to go into the deep metaphysics of soul. Uh, and about the levels of soul that exist. Uh, only to say that uh, in Egypt, there were nine levels of soul. And that was what was rife at that point when the Israelites were <coughs> enslaved in Egypt. When they left Egypt and made the reversing of, of their life of enslavement and left the confines of the enslaved world, which is called Egypt, the world around us here that we live in is Egypt. And so what was, is, and will be unless we make changes to reverse it. <coughs> And in yourself, as it says in our uh, spiritual practice of this tradition, uh, one of the missions of your life or the purpose of your life is the exodus from Egypt in yourself. So you're seeking to leave the land of bondage, enslavement, and uh, all the other uh, mistaken notions that we have brought into that enslave us. So, so what we teach are the ways to take yourself out of Egypt and to remove yourself. <laughs> The root K A I L O, K A I L O gives rise to, K yeah Kalo, and it gives rise to three, three four terms. Six. We'll, we'll we'll push the other two aside. The two that we could kind of we kind of shift to over is uh, hail and wholesome. Gives rise to those two words, but the three the four that I was interested in mostly was health. Heal, whole. Health, heal, whole. Three words. Fourth word that it gives rise to is holy. So my thesis is, is what the ancient tradition was and what my teacher taught me, what she put me onto. She sort of directed me in this way. She was my catalyst. So she, she was the instigator. Catalyst is what you put into a process that's, uh, that's uh, burbling. And uh, you add the catalyst to the uh, situation and then, the, situ then the, the process speeds up, and it comes to fruition, and the catalyst is withdrawn unchanged. So it can be used again for some, for some other condition. So, of course, I understood in my work that imagery is a mental enzyme. An enzyme is a catalyst. It's a mental enzyme. It's a catalyst for change, a catalyst for change, and a catalyst for bringing yourself into uh, wholeness, healing, health. But there is no way you can have an entirety, a complete system of health care without the holy, which is what we teach in our work, and how the holy introduces itself into the, uh, into the health care system, which is absent, of course, even in the, uh, even in the, in the well-intentioned Obamacare uh, or in any other system that exists. There is no system that exists that incorporates the holy as an intimate, integrated part it's an integrated system. Whole heal health holy is integrated. And if you don't have them, you don't have a system for yourself that brings you into this fullness of being, this fullness of being that we're aiming toward, this quest in our life, why we're put on earth and what we're doing here, one of the purposes. <laughs> We're looking at what does soul and body mean for us, body and soul. We are born, and we're born as a unit. We're born as a one, whole, heal, health, and holy. We're born as a whole unit, existing in every single moment as a physical, emotional, mental, social, moral being. At every instant, we exist as, as, those, as those five elements all at once, and we exist in them, there in us. In us, we're in them. We're reciprocally connected to all of that in our actual being in the world. So uh, Mary Magdalene pointed out 
uh, and it was also notated in the Egyptian hieroglyphs, uh, in the hieroglyphic renderings, that we are born of two natures. We're born of two natures. We're born with a material nature and we're born with a, a soul nature. The soul nature is what's called in, the, in, the, in terms of the wisdom literature, the substance. So the soul is a substance. Uh, it's called in the uh, Islamic tradition, in the Sufi tradition, it's called absolute matter. Absolute matter. So the, being that there's some form that can be uh, accessed in the substance, there's some form, and, but it has no volume of mass. It doesn't have the, the, material, uh, the material properties of our material nature. We're born of two natures, a form nature, and we're born of a substance nature. Uh, we're born, as it says in the uh, Genesis, we're born in the image and likeness of God. So we're born with the immortal seed, that's the image, that's the soul part of it. We're born in this, with this immortal seed that can never die. And uh, that's why when we pass on from here, if that should happen, uh, and that's the inevitability that you face, which I don't believe we need to face, and it's not in our, it's not in the wisdom literature that we're, we're meant to die. And if we do go, we go to another life, because the soul can never be extinguished. So that life force can never end. So it goes, and it, it, it passes through our body and goes to, this, to the substance side, back to the soul position. So... The, uh, so, this, so the form and the substance are operating as one when we're born. It's a, uh, it's a, I'm using the word with quotes around it. Uh, there's a law, Buddha, Buddha pointed it out uh, very succinctly. He said, uh, suffering is a lot of human existence. You're born to suffer, we're born to suffer. So what is the suffering? We're born to become dual. We're, we're born so that the body and the soul part. The essence uh, is uh, infinite, uh, it is uh, eternal, it is not bounded by time and space laws, by time and space consideration. It can go and it exists in the endlessness, the infinitude, uh, and the eternity of this endless magnitude, if you will, it's not an apt term, of what's called, for lack of a better term, I can't even give it a term. It's beyond universe. It goes to the stretches of endlessness. It's what's called in the wisdom literature the that without end. It can it it it, it, it radiates to the endlessness to, to the endlessness of existence of what is. It just goes. That soul. So uh, and it has an influence in our lives. Uh, in that, and what we learned through this work of spirit, of spirit, of this practice, is to bring the this essence into operation in our daily life of material nature, to have an influence on how we function in this in this time space world of materiality. This, uh, uh, so where we make access to the soul level, to the soul part. The, uh, the way that is given to us to make our connection to it is called imagination. And the major function of imagination is uh, mental imagery. So it's a function that is, uh, we're born with because we're born with both a material and a, and a soul nature. The forces that exist on the earth, the suffering, the ones because we get split in two when we're born and the one becomes two and we live a dual life, operating by standards imposed by the man-made world, the, the forces that run, the, we call it the forces of darkness that run this world that we live in. So the forces of darkness have set up standards that they are, have con uh, conditioned us and propagandized us and miseducated us to live thinking and making us believe they're important. Good, bad, right, wrong, success, failure, more or less, enough or insufficient, pretty, ugly, uh, uh, normal, abnormal, rich, poor, uh, all these, these dual standards are functionally 
um, errors. They're functionally falsehoods. They have no uh, real uh, value in our lives, uh, and yet we're forced to operate by them. We allow ourselves to be operated by operate by, uh, in the in the context of them. We seek to uh, to create a life to try and strive after them and to fulfill them. They're not meant to be fulfilled. Uh, they hold out a carrot for you to reach to get to, which then. Will, uh, presumably will give you the happiness, contentment, and peace that you've been yearning for and looking for, the freedom that you've been after, because everybody here has wanted freedom. People have come into this life, they want freedom. They know, they experience that they're enslaved in the suffering world, the enslaved world. And as Buddha said, the source of all this suffering, he said it, all the traditions say it. He said it concisely, succinct, succinctly, or the source of all the suffering is attachment. It's what? Attachment. Okay. Attachment. So you're attached. So you attach the ideas of, uh, of success, failure, good, bad, right, wrong. It's impossible to know what's right, what's right or wrong, good or bad, because they both, they all speak, all these standards speak to something that's awaiting you to fulfill in the future ahead of you. That there's something you're supposed to arrive toward to fulfill and get. And of course, it's constantly eluding us. So if somebody, you know, if you're trying to decide you're trying, which is in, incorrect, by the way, to decide whether something is good or bad, right or wrong. It's not a term that's apt for uh, looking at what you're going to do in a given situation. You're faced with a choice at every moment. It says in the uh, wisdom literature, at every moment, uh, I set before you life and death, good, uh, good and evil, blessings and curses, choose. There's no word, never appears, never appears in the Bible, the word decide. It only says choose. That's all it says, choose. That's all you're asked to do. What? I'm going to choose? Well, where will that lead? And of course, that brings into account the act of faith because it's a faithful act that's tied to your choices because you don't know where it's going to end up. Uh, you can't know because you would have to know the future and what the future holds for you. And, would, and so you, the decision that you take based on the choice is the action to fulfill the choice. That's it. There's nothing to do with good or bad or right or wrong. So we're torn apart because we have to try to understand is what we're doing, is this, is this the right person to marry? Uh, will this be the right job? Is it good for me to, uh, to get that uh, car? Uh, you don't know. There is no such thing as good or bad or right or wrong. These standards are really shams. They're illusory notions. You're asked to know the future and you are put into a great state of paralysis and doubt, doubt being the progenitor of this paralysis and the, and the, and the progenitor of all the mental confusion and disorientation and the, uh, the uh, uh, unattainable goals that you're asked to get to that will give you everything that you need and you see that it doesn't. This guy that did the research at Harvard, they asked the millennials, they, did a, they, they interviewed a bunch of millennials, and they said, what do you want most out of life? What is it, what's your top priorities in life? They said fame and wealth. Fame. fame and wealth was their top priorities. So they wanted to get money. They wanted to serve the god mammon, the god of avarice, greed, wealth, uh, evil, uh, and so on, the, uh, which is uh, cr connected to the law of coveting. So it's uh, wanting to claim and possess for yourself what doesn't belong to you as extensively as you can because the more wealth I accumulate, the happier I'll be, and so on and so forth, et cetera. So uh, we're bowing down to another god, uh, the god of wealth and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, money and goods and acquisition. So we're committing the seventh law violation of adultery, serving two masters at the same time, and the second law of idolatry, of bowing down before another, before another god, <coughs> who isn't God. All that being said, uh, we are now faced with needing, uh, as we're moving headlong into this world that's, that's uh, dominated by wealth and money and mammon and having to attain and, and collect as much as you can and get to certain positions of prominence and wealth because power and money are connected, so I can set up myself in a in a field of 
power, but a certain kind of power, a power in the service of control. With this money, I can control politics, the Koch brothers. I can control who gets, who gets elected, who doesn't. Of course, power and money are connected, and Mammon has it set up that the god of wealth uh, can control the, uh, the, the uh, circumstances of your life. So, uh, the, uh, so as, the, as, the, as the body part of us, as the material part, is, is torn, is grabbed by these f illusions and are pulled headlong into them and we get uh, caught in that trap, in that tentacle of the future, what the future will hold, which we can't possibly know. It's not in our hands. And God said to Moses, hey, I will be who I will be. I will be, I will be that I will be. I'm the future. You stay out. That belongs to me because I'm in charge of the whole shoot match, that's the spiritual point. The, the natural laws don't exist in the spiritual world. No such thing as natural law. There's not, it must be true. So there's no such thing as natural law in that sense. There, are no, there is no such thing. It can always be an intervention that turns things around, that shapes and reorganizes society and happens to change your frame of reference without you uh, really understanding what on earth is going on. It just happens like that, and it seems miraculous and so on, but it comes about because there's a hidden element that's always behind working that can overturn these laws. So we are, when the body is pulled from the soul, because remember, we're born as one. The hieroglyph showed that. When you look at the hieroglyph of, this, of the uh, standing figure in silhouette, he has one eye looking into the material world. He's one eye looking into the scene, and the other eye is looking outside the scene. Where's the eye looking? It's looking into the, into the hidden world, into the, uh, into the world of the unknown, into the world of holiness. It's looking uh, there, and it's looking here. It's saying, I'm born of two natures. I am born to look here and to look there, and to create a balance between the two. The material world has pulled us apart to such a degree that we need a connection to be formed and be brought back together to bring them back together. So what does spiritual practice do? It's a commitment to restoring the soul to the body. It does happen, and it can happen if the soul quits the body, you die also. If the soul has no further use for the home that it's finding itself in, and that, you, and that it finds that you're not caring for it in any way that's, uh, that's um, gratuitous, uh, and you're not showing gratitude for all that you've been given, which includes what I wrote in the article, in the blog, I had a lower back pain for several months in the right lower back. And I was thanking God for that. So I was thanking God always for the serendipitous things that happened. Colette visiting me on her birthday. I was thanking God for that. I was thanking God for the pain, for the difficulties. I always thank for all the disturbances because it says to me, hey, you left me. You left me. You 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 left your soul and body. You left. You you tore them away. Come back. <clears throat> you left your relationship to me, to spirit. You went away. And I want to give you a message that you need to come back. Please come back. And the only way I'm going to let you know, and the only way you'll know that you need to come back is I'm going to clop you. That's the technical term. I'm going to give you a clop in some way. That clop, of course is then given one of the 15, 20, 25,000 names that exist right now in the DSM, in the, uh, IC, on the ICD book, the Diagnostic Code for All the Medical Conditions. Uh, there are, there are, I counted it up, there are, I think, somewhere around 2,000 diagnostic ter diagnoses for cancer. You can have 2,000 different names of diagnoses for cancer. Uh, so, all the names are given, and it's all one name. The one name is the decay that's created by tearing the soul and the body apart from each other. And the body, of course, without the, uh, in, without the influence of this way, of, without relationship and without the holy, and without bringing holiness into your life, your body will wear out and decay. There's only one name for all that you're suffering. I don't care what names they give it to you, they give to you because they have very exquisite, extraordinary names. Charcot-Marie Tooth Syndrome. 
Heaven help you to get charcoal Marie Tooth Syndrome. It's not, it's not a dental problem. So, uh, but these are the kinds of terms that are exquisite, that are given to you, that blame you. Because every diagnostic label is a blame of you. That there's something wrong with you. It's blaming you. And since I'm blaming you, and I've now, uh, you're cowering now under the term, you need somebody who's an authority who can, put, who can put this to rest for you. And I'm your authority, and I know more about you because I know the name of this condition. So what I know means I know more than you know. And I am the one who you can put your, your hand, yourself in the hands of who will take care of you. And as that's happened, there's been no, uh, there's been increased more mortality, morbidity in people's lives in the general course of the system of uh, breakdown that we're experiencing. There's more, morbidity means more illness. And now every, you watch TV and every other ad is about a drug, a new drug. You can get, take a drug, a pill that will prevent pneumonia, it's a vaccine and so on, it's a lot of nonsense and all of that. So there's a new disease, a new drug and, there's all, a new, and all of that. So we got to put the soul and body back together. Well, how do we, so what's the function? Uh, what do we do to allow us to bring this back together? And the way of access into the soul region is imagination. Mental imagery as a function of it uh, is a way in which you make your way through, through uh, turning yourself away from the external world and turning yourself in to your inner uh, higher source of, uh, uh, of knowing and you use this inner process to go to the endlessness, the, uh, the uh, infinitude and eternity of the existence of your being. So you can delve deeply into this through this access route which is called imagery or imagination as the overarching function because imagination is an inner light. So it's also a technique, it's a method, and it's a realm of existence. So you can turn yourself in and find your way, and it takes your senses with it, and you, you put your senses on this light beam, and it takes you to this world of knowledge, of knowing and understanding about yourself, and you can find out who you are, what you are, what your purpose is for being here, how to unhook the suffering from yourself, by bringing the soul essence back into play, into uh, uh, influencing your time-space material essence. Because there's an imbalance in the material life. We're too taken over by it. We allow ourselves to be uh, overcome by uh, the, uh, uh, the craze about material, material goods and money and fame and power and becoming uh, rich as a standard, becoming one of the one-tenth of one percent that uh, now occupies uh, or now has in its, in its domain over 90 percent of the wealth uh, of America and so on. So this is a, uh, uh, a, a necessity that when this happens and you make your shift into this world, things begin to change for you. It's a catalyst for change. And you begin to see things that are new. We're going to do a couple of exercises tonight. See how you respond to them, what you think about them. This is called uh, voluntary simplicity. To become, and this is a way of bringing yourself back into coordination, bringing the two natures back together again. So you have a simple life, roof over your head, relationships, roof over your head, food on the table, clothing on your back, love, relationships, faith, hope, all the kinds of things that seem to matter in life. Okay. So breathe out long and slow through your mouth and breathe through your nose. And you get used to this even in a regular cycle of breathing, long, slow through the mouth and breathe through the nose. So you become calm, peaceful, relaxed, centered, focused. Know that you're breathing as one with all breathing creatures in the universe. And breathing, uh, making uh, contact with your higher or inner source <coughs> of wisdom. 
Nice. And on the next long out breath, see and know how and where your life is unnecessarily complicated. Be aware <coughs> of the distraction, clutter, and pretense weighing upon your life. And just choose, if you like, any one of those. A hologram. The one reflects the all. Take any one and see what you might do. Is this imagination and anything can happen to shift, change, reverse, turn it around in any way you want. Imagination, anything can happen. Try to do it. Uh, don't, uh, you don't have to spend too much Anything go, it can go as quickly as you like. There's no time space in the imaginal existence. Time is shortened. Breathe out one time slowly. Now see and live how true voluntary simplicity makes us live clearly and lightly. Keeping it for yourself Feel, know, and live how voluntary simplicity makes us aware of the world of invisible reality. And perhaps feel that connection. And after, breathe out and open your eyes. Everybody okay? Yes? Anybody uh, want to report? If you feel you would like to, you can. We are a loose affiliation of friends. One person's image is everybody's image. One person's image is everybody's image.